Okay, my name is Ernie Frankie. I'm in Pinellas County, and I'm going to be talking about a project we worked on in 2019, March to the Sea, reconnecting Woodstork Pond to Long Bayou Estuary. And it's the co author was Luis, uh, Luis uh, B. Levin. Okay, the question we ask is simply uh, what does uh, Gandhi's March to the Sea and Tampa Bay Estuary programs? Uh, charting the course and the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge have in common. We see each of these things, March of the Sea, the bridge, and uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Okay, our goals are simply, we get our goals from the uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program's Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, the CCMP, and it's charting the course is the name of the thing, and we're, we're going to be focusing on uh, uh, three or four of the goals, four of the goals right here. Invasive species, wipe out the uh, manage the invasive species in Tampa Bay area. Fish and wildlife, uh, preserve the abundance of uh, Bay Area wildlife. The Bay habits, enhance the ecosystem of the tidal tributaries. Uh, tributaries. In other words, remove any saline or salt barriers to keep tidal flush going. And then lastly is the public education and involvement promote uh, public involvement. So where we get our goals in this project is from the uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program, CCMP. Here are project goals uh, for, the, uh, for this project. Removal invasive species. We take out Brazilian peppers, carrot woods, and bean trees from the watershed. We replace them with uh, Florida native pine trees. In fact, uh, they long leaf uh, pines. Restoration of connecting streams. From the, uh, we uh, dredged two stormwater ponds and Woodstork Pond. We dredged between Woodstork Pond and the existing tidal stream. We dredged the tidal stream all the way to the Long Bayou Estuary for tidal flush. That's the big thing here, tidal flush. And as a result, we reconnected Woodstork Pond with Long Bayou. We restored the habitat for specific uh, endangered species, specifically the uh, Rosebill. Uh, rosette, rosette, spoonbill, and the wood store. And we also, it serves as a fish nursery, uh, the uh, mangrove area uh, around uh, wood store pond. The uh, educational uh, part of the program is that we have the monthly uh, wetland committee reports to our HOA. We have the bi weekly, that's twice a week, committee newsletters of volunteer works, and the PowerPoint presentations at local, regional, and state levels. We also have a thing called uh, conservation modules, where one, the, it's a PowerPoint presentations based on things we've learned over the years. And we uh, put those on the website and other places. And we have conduct tours of our nature reserve and stormwater ponds. Here's where we live. The adult, uh, um, it, it's an adult uh, condominium. You can see we have 77 acres here. And we're going to be focusing on this one area right here. But what you can see that most of the 77 acres is actually nature reserve. This is in uh, Pinellas County, uh, just south of Lake Seminole. This is uh, Long Bayou right here. We'll be focusing in this area here, and especially getting a, uh, a link between uh, Long Bayou and Woodstock Pond. Woodstock Pond's right there. We have two lakes, 10 stormwater ponds and uh, we're on the edge of Long Bayou. Here's an aerial shot of uh, where we're gonna be talking about. I've switched orientation. You see some of the nature reserves. This is all mangroves here. We have 1.1 mile of mangrove shoreline that we maintain. So going from left to the right, we have Woodstork Pond over here. This is back uh, nearly 20 years ago. And we have to, we'll be removing the uh, and peppers and everything. And then, and then here we're going to revitalize the uh, uh, tidal stream in order to get tidal flush all the way from Long Bayou all the way into Woodstork Pond. It was available 20 years ago, but it's been overgrown with invasive species. Here's another closer view of it 20 years ago, too, or nearly 20 years ago. Now you'll see two things and Hinga Pond over here and the pool pond over there, and they both overflow 
into Wood Stork Pond. This is Wood Stork Pond right here. And then you can see the tidal stream right there from uh, nearly 20 years ago. Also, there's a connection here. Here's Wood Stork Pond. There's a connection to the tidal stream right there. And it would tidal flush into uh, Wood Stork Pond. In Wood Stork Pond, you'll have a lot of things. It's a nursery. It's a place for uh, colony birds, that sort of thing. Okay, first we start off with restoring the connection of the two stormwater ponds, the Wood Stork Pond. He's part of our crew here. We have a crew of about 35 volunteers. These are senior citizens, mind you, five and older. And looking at the Swift Mug map from uh, about 25 years ago, we see the two ponds, the Pool Pond and an Inga Pond right there, and they overflow into Wood Stork Pond right here. First thing we had to do is clean this ditch out in order to get a free flow of the overflow from these two stormwater ponds into a Wood Stork Pond. That's the first thing. Okay, and uh, we did that. Then next we restored the uh, connection to the tidal basin. Here's Wood Stork Pond here, and we cleaned out this connection right here into the tidal stream right there. Uh, we're going to be removing uh, three major uh, invasive species. We have the Brazilian pepper, carrot wood, and the gumby bean tree. These are listed like uh, category one uh, for the pepper and the carrot wood on Flipsy's uh, uh, invasive plant list. The bean tree is on category two. So these are these are just simply taking over, hybridizing with natives and giving a mess. Okay, the uh, invasive species removal, which is under the CCMP, is one of our goals. And we divided up into three phases because the cost of all this is amazing and the time and everything. So we have uh, three phases. First is removal of the invasive trees in the north side of the pond, which are pond. And then uh, next is the removing in the south side of the pond. And then finally, the uh, invasives along the tidal stream, which is 2019. You'll also notice that these are supported a lot by uh, grants, HOA budget, uh, many grants, things like that. We'll see more of that later. Okay, so we're gonna uh, collaborate with several other organizations too. We got together with uh, Keep Pinellas Beautiful, Native Plant Society, Wilcox Nursery, our own HOA, Flipsy, Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and Tampa Bay Environmental uh, Research Funding, or whatever what is it, a restoration fund. I'm sorry, T Bird. Each of those contributed in different ways for funding, approval, advice, this sort of thing. So now we'll put it all together and look at it from, uh, from Google Earth. Here we are in uh, the initially. Now you, it's hard to even see Woodstork Pond, but Woodstork Pond is right here. It's a dry season. And uh, around surrounding it is mangrove. Surrounding that is Brazilian peppers, which is simply solid. So in phase one, we took out the Brazilian peppers on the north side, went all the way up to mangroves. So all the peppers are taken out right there. And next, we took out the phase two, we took out all the peppers in the bottom half in 2017 around Woodstork Pond. Okay, here's 2019 when the project is going. And uh, we started out removal of invasive species along the tidal stream. We dredged the tidal stream. First, we had to get to the tidal stream, and that re involved removing the uh, invasive species. Then we selected some Florida native trees to place along the stream to give an optical barrier to an acoustic barrier to the, some of the buildings that we own. And uh, so, anyway. We have this uh, stream and we have solid peppers there. Can't see through them at all. And it surprises us. We started taking out the peppers. What did we find? A bridge from our neighbor's house to our house. The neighbor's over there. This is our land over here and the tidal stream in between. And he had placed a bridge. Some people call that trespassing. Anyway, if you look at it a little bit, what you'll find is that the neighbor here put the bridge in. It's an aluminum bridge, 20 foot aluminum bridge. And uh, he started growing uh, weed or marijuana there. He cleared out the area. His neighbors couldn't even see it because the 
peppers were so great. For instance, here's the neighbor. Here's where the bridge was. He had cleared this area out. His neighbors couldn't even tell what he was doing over there. It was just so thick with the uh, uh, Brazilian peppers. Anyway, so advice from the city said, uh, send him a letter, uh, make it uh, a secure letter. And he responded. We gave him two choices. Either take the bridge out, you know, and uh, that would be it. Or the second choice would be deny ownership and we'll take the bridge out. We prefer that. We responded immediately. He says, denied ownership. And uh, he assumed we'll take it out. So that afternoon, we got an F-250 truck, a lot of volunteers, and took it from his land and got it on our land. The, uh, the nice part about this was we needed a bridge like that right there. Uh, well, we just had to move it like 90 degrees and uh, across the uh, a stream, that little stream that was feeding was Dirk Bond from the tidal stream. Here's the uh, group of volunteers that they, we got on the bridge and we're standing around thinking we should name this bridge. And there was a lot of funny names. And then finally somebody said, why don't we call it the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge? And shortly after that, somebody in the crowd said, who was Mary Jane anyway? You sort of like that innocence, don't you? Anyway, adding the, the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge, we took it from the neighbor's house right there, and then we put it across this, this, this stream right here that was feeding Woodstork Pond. By clearing all this area out and adding the bridge and all that stuff, we extended our, our nature walk by uh, from a little over a mile, a mile and a half, to almost two miles long. It goes around our entire property. It goes around Woodstork Pond, and it continues along the the uh, the mangroves right next to the uh, Long Bayou, all the way up to the front entrance of our property. Okay, so we uh, next is we've got to remove the invasive trees along the 800 feet of tidal, the tidal stream. This connects the Woodstork Pond all the way to Long Bayou to allow the tidal flush. So we hired uh, a group of professionals, some professionals, and we're clearing this stuff. If it's larger than a foot in diameter, that's a little too large for us. The professionals get it. You can see some of these things are like 20 years of growth there. And uh, the thing is, all the mulch remained on site. We used all the mulch there. Here's some of the volunteers you see here. After the professionals would come in, in the, during the day, we'd go and clear everything up at night, clean it up, take a little more peppers out, that sort of thing. This isn't all the volunteers, it's just the volunteers that particular day. It's very important to have an active set of volunteers, and you can do that through our, our methods of, of uh, public education there. Here's, here's before, here's invasive trees, and the tidal stream is behind behind these trees here. Here it is after, after we've cleared all the, the uh, peppers and things like that, carrot wood along the stream before and after. Also, you'll see where we added 28 longleaf pines. Here's one here and then there's another there. What we're trying to do is keep an optical barrier, an acoustic barrier from the neighbors over there to our, our property. And uh, we just continue on clearing uh, vines and trees and things like that. A lot of cleanup work that the, uh, the different crews of volunteers that we have. Okay, in order to dredge the tidal stream, they had to clear it up. This is what it looked like before, and then it's after. This is just simply volunteers clearing all this stuff out right there. This is what it looked like. There's a tidal stream. There it is. And uh, we just have several work parties clearing all that stuff out so we could get the dredging machines in there. So we had to hire a dredging machine. We we chose a mini excavator, a small one, sort of a gutsy guy. Gave us a good price, did a lot of work, but we're working with him to clear the stream out, you know, take the muck out and get it flowing again. See these pictures, the job that it was to do that. Three days of, of, of the mini excavator. Okay, we want to restore this area, the Woodstork Pond area, or threatened wood stork habitat, and the Rosette Spoonbill especially. The Tampa Bay Estuary, Tampa Bay area is a key place habitat for this uh, colonizing bird. Okay, 
all as I said, all the mulch was generated. We kept that and we you can use that to fill in and cover and, and use that as a, the base of a trail. Then we replaced the invasive trees along the tidal stream with these uh, longleaf pines or the native pines. We have to maintain it too as we're clearing it up, constantly clearing up, uh, stopping erosion, these sort of things. You see different people, different work for groups at different times. Public education, that's one of our other goals. We, uh, at the local level, we presented our project at the June meeting, 2019, of the Florida Native Plant Society. Newspaper articles, conservation modules, website tours. At the regional level, we had an article in uh, the Bay Sounding Magazine, talking about this great project. And at the state level, at the FLIPSI newsletter. Yeah. Another thing we have, and it's under, it's under modification right now, is our own very own website there. See how it's organized, the different things. Uh, the conservation modules are shown in red. It's in all of them, hidden all of them, but it's, it's a lot of them. Here's a list of most of them right here. Previous ones before this, before 2019. See the different things. Forehand, uh, breeding islands, turtle basking islands, removing Brazilian peppers, starp to control hydro. All these things we've learned over the years. We want to share them with others. We put these modules on our website and other people's website. We added some more modules in 2019. The uh, the uh, the website was was very much a success. Here's the stats for 2019. Where you can see, we have about uh, about 850 visitors each month, and a lot of those are new ones too. It was very successful. Every two weeks, we send every twice a week we send out a newsletter with his comical graphical episodes that we have, and it keeps the uh, binds the team together. We also report monthly to our own HOA, give them a detailed report going on, answer questions and things. And at the regional level, we have articles in local newspapers showing our nature reserve, and then pictures constantly and stories and stuff like that. Then we also did another thing which is very successful, a photo calendar project for 2019. We developed a plan. We uh, had a contest, a photo contest, photos around our nature reserve. And uh, went through those, had eight inventories. We ordered calendars at about five bucks each, sold them at 10 bucks each, made a handy profit. And then the extra calendars were given away as welcoming packets for new homeowners and stuff, and also given out at state conferences, sort of things. Here's uh, some of the sample pages on cover, rear cover, the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge, a, uh, a map to all of our ponds, stormwater ponds, and then some of the photos that our own residents sent in. Let's look at the hours. If we uh, look at the hours, this is 2019 hours on the project. We come up with 352 hours. And if you uh, use the volunteer rate of $25 an hour, national volunteer rate, we donated 33,000 in volunteer efforts in the first nine months. Uh, and 8,000, almost 9,000 just in the Woodstock project. It's a very active volunteer team. If we look at it over three years, the uh, totals are we get about over $60,000 for the project, the Woodstock project. And that's divided equally, pretty much equally, between the HOA budget, volunteer labor, and conservation grants. So we ask, how, did, how well did we do? Did we remove the invasive species from the site? The peppers, the carrot with the bean trees? Yes. Did we reconnect the stormwater pond to the estuary? Sure did. The big thing there was to have a maintenance plan in place. You can do a lot of this stuff, but if you don't maintain it in five, 10, 15 years, it'll be back like it was before. We did restore the habitat for the uh, Woodstock pond, which was threatened by invasive species. And uh, now it's all mangroves completely surrounding the, the uh, Woodstock Pond, and it's got a, a connection to the, uh, to the Long Bayou, or a, a estuary flush. A re, uh, regional education, we 
you look at the statistics from the number of visitors to our website, and that we had a heap amount of presentations at local, regional, and state levels and articles. Is there a change in attitude? Yes, you can see the change in attitudes reflected in the HOA budget that they're willing to do this. They have a they're putting a reserve in for pond erosion, and we have a maintenance plan incorporated in our lawn and pond maintenance contracts. I'd like to thank the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, the Mini Grant Program, the Flipsy Education Grant, the uh, Florida Native uh, Society uh, Grant and the several Tampa Bay Estuary Restoration Fund. It was a big one helped out. And uh, Florida Lake Management Society's Love Your Lake Grant, without whose help we would never have started or finished. We ask the question again, what does Gandhi's Salt March to the Sea, Tampa Bay's Charting the Course, and the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge have in common? They're all associated with salt and restoration. Gandhi's uh, March to the Sea brought uh, notice of the problem that was happening. Ours did too. By reopening the uh, Woodstock Pond, it was a symbol of restoration of the balance of nature. And the uh, Tampa Bay's charting the course, we achieved the uh, uh, removal of the salinity barriers. And uh, we got the uh, tidal flush going again. And uh, it acts as a nursery and also a place for endangered uh, colonizing birds. The Mary Jane Memorial Bridge it provides a, a path across the tidal stream leading to the Woodstock Pond. So that was uh, serendipity. That's something we never expected. It's a bit of a symbol for our volunteer project. Came together in a serendipitous manner. No one went to jail. That's pretty much it. Anybody have any questions? We have several questions from the audience. The highest ranked question today is from Deborah Klein. How do you prevent the Brazilian peppers from reseeding if the plants have been chopped into mulch? Okay, uh, keep them reseeding. We actually poisoned every, every one that we cut. We poisoned it and with Kylon. And, and my, the other thing is maintenance. We keep after it. We go over it and clip off any that come up, pull up. We actually pull them up. If they're under an inch, we can pretty well pull them up. But it's a maintenance. It's a it's a tedious job, and we started out with uh, a lot of. I mean, over the whole uh, our whole HOA complex for campus, we now have probably uh, removed probably ninety five percent of the preppers. But it's a constant thing of because they'll reseed and the seeds will come up later and things like that. So it's a matter of maintenance and and pushing the volunteer program. This is their land, the volunteers, their homeowners in the HOA, and uh, they care about it. They care about the nature trail, two mile nature trail. They care about the beauty of it and they care about the animals. And uh, so that I did a lot of, I mean, a tremendous amount of volunteer help. These are all over 55. That's incredible. <clears throat> this is such a great project. It takes a lot of effort of communications, public education and communications. We have folks also coming from other communities to help out simply because they like the camaraderie and they like to see what we're doing and they like to come and visit and walk the trail. And so with the Brazilian pepper, you know, you're not mulching the seeds, right? You're removing the seeds ahead of time. Well, inevitably there are seeds that are mulched, but if you have the mulch and it keeps the sun out, uh, they pretty well die off. Okay. I, I'd rather do that than ship them off. It, it's first off, it saves on the uh, professional removal of that. If you don't have to haul off uh, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, clippings, the chippings, and also the company that does it brings in mulch to us. We have to spread it, but they'll bring in mulch from oaks and things like that from their trimming. Uh, they don't bring in Brazilian peppers, but the peppers that are there that we've chipped, mulched. We keep, and it's just a matter of maintaining it for, you know, the 2019, it's been almost well, two years now. And uh, we, by maintenance, by pulling out any little seedlings that come, we had to do, uh, we achieve it. Uh, you know, they die off after a while, or it becomes uh, 
pepper free. Great. So Danny Young posted that he'll be interested to hear how you use grant funding on private lands. So I think you pretty much covered how you use grant funding on private lands. But I think his question was more, did you come across any barriers in using grant funding on private land? Uh, no. We allow people to use our uh, our uh, uh, nature trail and everything. We're we're quite open about its private land. I mean, all the grants they require approval of the HOA. You know that the HOA is behind it and all that stuff. The HOA pretty much is like uh, matches everything. We match everything in volunteer uh, hours and funding. Uh, some of them aren't as uh, uh, Nickety about being private land, but we uh, it didn't seem to be a uh, a barrier. But I could see in other cases it's a barrier. Uh, you can see the different fundings that we had. It takes a lot of work to get those fundings, also, mm -hmm. and it's demonstrated performance. Yeah, a lot, most of these are because we've been doing this for about ten years now. So, uh, a demonstrated performance is a big big factor, also. Mm -hmm. And Juliet Rainier, our executive director, asks, was it difficult to get your HOA on board initially? Uh, yes, it was. It was, a, it, was, it was hard getting the volunteers going. I went three years of, of cleaning ponds and restoring ponds before I had my first volunteer. So three years of doing it, people just coming by and seeing what we could do. And then the uh, neighboring building, and I was working on one pond, and the neighboring building said they wanted the same thing for their pond. So I organized the building as most of the volunteers, and it just grew and grew and grew. Once they saw what could be done on restoring the freshwater ponds, stormwater ponds, then they uh, it just it just grew from that. The volunteers did. It was yeah. very hard, and uh, then it's, it took a while to get the HOA behind it. But essentially, they were getting free. You know, like two thirds of the project was uh, free essentially with grants and volunteer time. So they only, essentially they were uh, contributing one third, they got three times the amount of, of uh, beauty out of the whole thing. And it does help, they sell the, uh, that's one of the selling features of the Shores of Long Bayou condominium is the nature reserve. The people are very proud of it. And as a result, we continually get new volunteers all the time as the old ones either die off or leave or whatever. It's a long process. Mm -hmm. So to start your, so obviously three years of hard work is, I mean, commendable, awesome. Uh, did you have a hard time convincing the HOA to let you start cleaning up, like initially? Uh, no, because they, uh, see I'm an electrical engineer and I, the only experience I had was my son and I dug a fish pond one time Oh, about 20 years ago. That was my only experience. So he, uh, the uh, the manager, HOA manager, allowed me to uh, have a go of it. it was, he didn't, it wasn't gonna cost the HOA anything on the restoration of the very first pond. And then once that was, that, I, that got into a lot of articles, wrote a lot of articles about it and everything and it looked beautiful. Lily pads and native plants, Florida native plants throughout the whole thing. And he was impressed. So. Once you have some demonstrations, uh, then it, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. He said, go for it. In fact, the building right next to, to mine, you know, once they saw what I did in my pond, they said they wanted me to do it in their pond. I told them they didn't have a pond. And uh, that's a building next door. And so we went around the back, and sure enough, there was a pond. But it was hidden because it was all overgrown with uh, mostly peppers and uh, carrot wood and things like that. First thing we had to do is these are old people, and I uh, got them out there and we cleared the the peppers at least chopped them down so we could see what we're dealing with. And I said I told them I says if we don't get a grant, you know we're going to quit. But I couldn't even see the pond; it was, it was covered. This is the building next door. Wow. So and then it just grew from that. And then we then there was some ponds that were like out front of the HOA, and like and we made those into a showcase. And we'd win awards constantly. We have two awards from the uh, Native Plant Society on restoration. We have uh, two of the Game of Golden Mangrove Awards, which is the best project in the Tampa Bay area on restoration of uh, stormwater ponds and areas. So 
started winning awards and articles. It's a lot of work, a lot of publicity. Uh, public education is the real key to the whole thing. We would be working like with the local uh, Native Plant Society. They would come for tours and I'd take them on the uh, trail and take them around and show them what could be done using native plants and stuff. So a lot of work, a lot of public education. That was the key had to bring all these people along. And each of the grants, they want to know why is it going to succeed? And for us, it was easy because we just go to the past and show what we had already done. So once we got the ball rolling, it was kind of easy and you know, momentum kept it going. But it was hard at first. And now it's a maintenance sort of thing. Other questions? That's all the questions. You have uh, Becky Stern says your efforts and results are commendable. And I love the humor regarding the Mary Jane Memorial Bridge. Yeah, it was so funny when just when that when that person in the back says something like, "Who was Mary Jane anyway?" I guess they didn't go to the right college. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we do. We have one last question. How do you kill the non-natives? I'm assuming Roundup from Keeley Coulter. Okay, that's become recently. It's become in the headlines and stuff like that. We were using Garlon, and uh, now we've gotten away from that, and we just simply, uh, you know, rely on uh, cutting and cutting it uh, down as low as we can, and then uh, keeping after all the little seedlings that come along. You know, if it's one inch or, or half an inch, one inch or stuff, we can pull it. We've got some pretty strong people there to pull there, and we just it's education on uh, showing each of the volunteers exactly what a carrot wood, a bean tree, a pepper, things like that look like. And uh, we just pull them. And it's a constant thing of every Saturday morning. No, no, once a month. The first Saturday of the month, we have a work party and we go after different areas and just clear them off again. If there's any seedlings. You do that a couple of times and, uh, you know, then they're gone. But we also did some other things too. We'd have the HOA would back us and that they would give us a, a free uh, pancake breakfast. So we go and work and stuff, and then we come back and have a pancake breakfast for free. It was a, each supports each other. We support the HOA with the calendars and everything, publicity, this sort of thing. They support us in many ways too. So Lily Anderson Messick was wondering if you could estimate how much weekly time is spent on maintenance of these landscapes. How much weekly time who? Is spent on ma maintaining the landscapes. Well, right now we're doing uh, one work party a month, the first Saturday of each month. And that lasts about an hour or two hours, something like that. But in between, several of the people get together and work on different areas, like stormwater ponds. The people have adopted the ponds and uh, they take them over and take pride in them. You know, when somebody's adopted a pond there, they, uh, they get all the advice we can give them, but they're pretty well responsible for taking out all the invasives, putting in native plants. And then, you know, as a result, when their visitors come, they show off their pond and, and they add fish and all kinds of things. It's like a pet when they adopt it. And that helps a lot too, because you don't have to worry about it. When you have 10 stormwater ponds, that's a lot of ponds to maintain. And you just can't do that. With the pond maintenance people, they just use chemicals and, and they don't care as much. But uh, the uh, individuals, when they adopt a pond, they uh, take tremendous care of it. Tremendous. The only thing we're fighting is really old age, the volunteers. Right. They're 55 and over folks, fending off alligators and stuff like that. <laughs> Beating them with sticks. I got lots of alligator stories. So there's a lot of adventure here too. It, yeah. Um, Barbara Howell would like your email address. Oh, okay. It's uh, there's the front, the first slide. Just go back if I can. There you go. Anyway, okay. Uh, it should be there. There. Uh, oh no, it's not there. It's not there. Okay. It's simply E A F R A N K E, E A Frankie, one word, at Tampa Bay dot R dot com. Okay, I put that in the chat. Or you, or you can Google like Mary Jane Memorial Bridge. Yeah, that's it. Just Google Mary Jane Memorial Bridge. 
you'll get the uh, the article from Bay Soundings. Just Google Mary Jane Memorial Bridge. And it's the first slide has, has my email address on it. Okay. All right. And uh, just one last question. Deborah Klein would like to know if you're having, if you had any problems, like say mulching or handling the Brazilian pepper because it's in the poison ivy family. Uh, no, we haven't. I, I know it's in the poison ivy family, but we haven't had any problems with it. No uh, skin disease or skin problems or anything like that. And we handle a lot. And then the big stuff, the foot and uh, one foot in diameter and greater stuff was handled by the, uh, uh, mostly by uh, Meadows Tree Service, which who we got to know, and we'd work with them also, which is, you know, some of these things are kind of hard because they have insurance issues and things like that. But we go out and show an interest and become buddies with them. And as a result, we've used them for three years and uh, they give us the, they, we get, we get the uh, pepper removed. We always schedule everything for the time when they're not doing anything else. So we get the best price from them. And we work with them. It's hard because uh, they have laws, protection laws, uh, steel toed shoes, and all these other things. And there's a lot of things we can do that keep away from the machinery, just falling trees and things like that back and forth, feeding them and, and doing other things. So all this stuff goes together. It's public education and involvement and uh, trying to keep a spirit going, like a club spirit going. And uh, and they, uh, they own it and stuff like that. I mean, uh, it's just a, a team, building a team. Great. And we have one last sort of comment by Douglas Kupar, who says, can we get a follow-up session next conference? We love Ernest. Yes, I'm actually working on a kind of an interesting thing in communicating with plants right now, where I can uh, see plants communicating with each other. And actually, I'm talking to plants, too and recording it. So there's a lot of exciting things going on here. Hopefully I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be around for, uh, I have a session next year. Yeah, that'd be good. And I think someone posted and asked or organizers anything. I think, yes, okay. Susan Atherton would like a copy of your PowerPoint if possible. Oh uh, yes, if you just email me, I'll send you, send you a PDF of it. No problem. Okay, and Susan, you're in the community tab. If you could hop on over to the chat, Juliet posted his email in the chat. Okay, yeah, just send me that and I'll just instantly send you a copy of it. Send you anything you want to, uh, some of the conservation modules or whatever, whatever interests you that we've done. We've done a lot of work with, uh, <laughs> even though walking catfish and stuff like that, some oddball things. Awesome. Okay, well, Ernie, just thank you so much for doing this in a condo with an HOA. Uh, we're also- You're With old people. With old, old people. people. I mean, I don't, I feel like I probably shouldn't say old people, but because I'm no, not that's an old what person. we are. Okay, well, anyways, good job with that. And um, I hope everyone enjoys your lunch breaks. Thank you so much for presenting today, Ernie. And okay, thank you for inviting me. Of course, I yeah. appreciate it. We're, so thrilled that you accepted and uh, we'll see you at the next conference, if not before then. Okay. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Valerie.